Um, anybody here who's got intention to go into government or policy making at one point in the class? Any people who want to work department for education or like anybody here who's got an interest in government and policy making? What do you want to do later on in life? Accountants, okay. And this says what do you guys want to become later in life? What are you what are your plans? Hmm? Oh, okay, okay, sounds good. Yeah, so I see, I'm not sure how relevant it is to accounting, but yeah, in general, the idea is to talk about what we as individuals can, to, can do about development and how we can improve our communities. So that's going to be the focus of the talk. Okay, and with this, I think, um, oh, you see, I put a hashtag in the corner. So anybody who's on Twitter, if you want to tweet about the lecture, feel free. I always find it quite nice if uh, people can follow the lecture online. So yeah, the hashtag is UJBQ. Um, and that is because BQ is the company that I work for. So I'm with the University of Johannesburg, but I'm working for a research project called Building Capacity to Use Research Evidence. And we are based at Bunting Campus, and our program is funded by the Department of International Development uh, from the UK. So they gave us an external grant at the beginning of this year, and it's a three-year program to improve South African government's capacity to use research evidence, and at the same time to improve the uptake of research evidence within South Africa in general. And yeah, so my first name is Lawrence, so and I, if you have a question, please address me by my first name. I find that more engaging. Okay, so any questions before I start? Anybody wants to know anything? Everything clear? Everything fine? Okay, okay perfect. Um, so, the objectives of the talk. Well, firstly, I'm going to try to avoid that. I hope I'm going to keep you awake, basically, for the next 60 minutes. Um, so, in that sense, the first objective clear is to keep you awake. I know it's early, my apologies for that. I'm going to try to be as active as possible. Um, second objective is show you how to change the world. It might be sounding a bit big-headed, but I do think that is what uh, the remit of our project, how to increase development, how to reduce poverty, how to increase inequality. So that is a bigger narrative. So hopefully you can take away something of that at the end of this lecture. And I'm afraid since this is an academic talk, there's also a number of academic um, objectives that you just have to bear with me. So the first one is I'd really like to introduce a concept of citizen-based monitoring to you, so that after this talk you'll know what citizen-based monitoring is and what it can add to society. Secondly, show you why and how your government, I mean, it's not me, like I didn't dream of that idea of citizen-based government. That comes straight from the ANC, like from a policy paper that they released last year, which is actually, I'm not sure if it's online already, but you might have it at EduLink at one point, like this is the citizen-based monitoring framework which was developed by the ANC. And yeah, so I'd like to explain to you why and how the ANC thinks that is a really good idea. And lastly, I'm going to link that, then how we can actually use the citizen-based monitoring framework to actively shape policy making in this country. Any questions about the objectives? Anything unclear? OK, good. So then the last academic slide, uh, let's get off Let's get rid of jargon. I know there's a couple of terms that I'll be using that I understand pretty well in my geeky academic researcher type of world. And I just try to make sure that we're all on the same page if I talk about these. So if I talk about monitoring, I really talk about observing, collecting, and recording information. So you filling out a card after you've been to the nurse at the clinic, filling out a card, how was the service, was all the medication there, that is monitoring. Like, we don't need anything more fancy to know about monitoring. Citizens, I'm not going to go into detail, that's all of us. We're all citizens of South Africa, so we're all included in this active citizenship. And uh, hopefully I'm not going to get into trouble with the experts on the term. But for the purpose of this uh, talk, I defined it as basically us as citizens trying, to be trying our best to improve our communities. So that is, I think, at the most basic level what um, I understand under active citizenship. Um, Policy, also very broadly defined, any government program, any government legislation that aims to improve uh, 
our living together in South Africa. That's a policy for me. I know there are much more technical definitions of it, but for the purpose of this talk, a policy is really any program, any idea, um, any legislation of government. <coughs> evidence. Evidence is a, a big word, and I'm going to ask you later on what you understand under evidence. Um, for now, uh, really evidence is any information that can be verified and is trustworthy. So any piece of information, a document, a recording, a video, all of that is a piece of information that can be verified that would count as evidence. And then lastly, effective. If I talk about effective policies, effective programs, what I do talk about is something that leads to the desired results. So if I want to become a soccer player, if I train hard and it works, that was an effective training. So really very broadly defined. Are there any questions about my definitions or do you want me to challenge on any of those? Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Come again. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to come to that. Evidence informed policy. So if I define policy as government programs and legislation and I define evidence as verifiable and trustworthy information, well then evidence informed policy making clearly is any policy that is based on veri verifiable and trustworthy information. So I think that's straightforward. That's why I think, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, mm, my question to you. Does this, I hope you can see, does this look familiar? Anybody has seen something like that before? There should be four pictures in there. Any, any idea where these schools might be? Hmm? Okay. Hector Pisa? Okay. Well, yeah, I think so. I think I get the sense. Yeah, these are all pictures that, uh, from South African schools. Not all in the rural areas, some in the urban areas. Um, let's go through it. So, what's, what's the problem with the first picture, with the little boy who's actually doing the pic picture bomb, like destroying my picture a bit? What's, what's the problem there? What can we see? Overcrowded, exactly. Is there a, a teacher in the picture? No, no? Okay. A second picture, what, 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 what does that look like? Textbooks, exactly, like it's lots of unused textbooks. Um, the third picture, well, what's happening there? No. How, how does a blackboard look like? Does it look big enough? No. So the first three pictures re reflect a very common situation in South Africa, and I think some of you might have actually experienced that when you went to school yourself. And I think it's fair enough to say that we have a problem with education in this country. And this is not to blame anybody for it. Like neither the government, nor the teachers, nor the local communities. It's just to acknowledge we have a problem. Our classrooms are overcrowded. Our teachers are not there on time. Our textbooks are not used adequately. Learning materials in terms of um, blackboards and tables are not necessarily in a good state. So the question is, well, this is a problem. So what can you see in the last picture? What can you see there? We see two students, and what do they hold in their hands? <laughs> Cell phones. So that picture is taken from a citizen-based monitoring program, which is implemented in uh, Limpopo. And that really means that government acknowledges that we have all these problems, that in Limpopo we have a problem with textbook delivery, we have a problem with overcrowding. But now also in Limpopo at the same time, there are more than 4,000 schools. So how possibly could government know about every problem in any school? Like, I mean, the policymaker, he's in his office in, like, in Joburg, on Pretoria, they wouldn't know. So what they did in the first picture is they gave students cell phones, like very basic cell phones, not, nothing fancy, no iPhones, no Samsungs, um, your basic phones, and every time if they went to school and there was a problem at their school, they could just punch in a number, you know, like dial one, dial two, star, whatsoever, and report straight to government. Today my teacher didn't pitch. Today uh, we didn't have a chalkboard. Today we didn't have textbooks. And the idea behind that really was that we need to know about these problems. And the people who actually have the best information about the absence of services is us as citizens. It's you as pupils, is the principal of the school. But the problem is how does government know about it? Because government cannot possibly monitor each and every school like 24 hours. So in the first picture, that is a pilot program where students are allowed to monitor their own school. And they can report absent teachers, 
and that we can report, reps, they can report absent materials. And so far, it's doing really well. And this is, I think, then a case study of how we can get into the lecture. So this is the idea of citizen-based monitoring, like giving the power about information to the citizens, to us, basically. So, if we then talk about monitoring and service delivery. As I said, government provides a vast amount of services in this country. Any, apart from education, what else does government provide for us? Any, any other service that government does? Anything? Do you have water at home? Is that a service from government? Do they provide that? Don't they? You've got electricity at home. Yes, it's also a government service. Can you drive on roads that are well maintained? Partly, I guess. But yeah, that's also a government service. So government is really doing quite a lot in terms of service delivery in this country. And so if we break it down, there's over 250 official districts in South Africa. This is just on an administration level. Um, on top of that, these are actually, we have over 24,000 schools in this country, like from primary level to high school level. And we have over 4,200 clinics. And by whatever number we want to go with, there's over 50 million people in South Africa at any given point in time. So then the question is really, if we have such a vast amount of services, if we have such a big kind of program, if service delivery is such a big thing, such a big mission, then can we really be expecting government to know about every little program, problem that emerges. So if my tab in Alex stops working today, how is government got to know about it? If for a couple of months, like some schools in Limpopo do not get textbooks, how can government really know about it? If we talk about the textbook scandal in Limpopo, we only knew about it because it was so big. It was so big that the media jumped on it. And that's why we knew about it. But I can tell you now, I just came from the Eastern Cape. I was in two schools that didn't have textbooks either. But because it's not a systematic challenge there, no one is reporting about it. And people are moaning about it, but government doesn't know. So they're not going to do anything to fix it if they don't know about it, clearly. So then there seems to be, if we talk about monitoring and service delivery, we really need to make sure that government knows what's going on. So then my question to you, Buti, who has ever complained about a government service to anyone? Have you ever complained to your friends? If the electricity is gone, what do you do? So you complain, eh? <laughs> if, the, if the police doesn't pitch, what are you, what, what are you doing? So we, we complain, you know, we are, we are unhappy, you know, especially if you go to, to Joburg's fancier suburbs, well, people are complaining all the time about something. It's not safe enough, the traffic light is not working, the air is not good enough, there's no way where I can walk my dog, I cannot cycle here, so yeah, we, we do complain. But then, so if your electricity goes, who do you complain to if your electricity would go? You're going straight to the city? Okay, you go, well, that's good. You go to ESCOM. But usually I have a feeling that um, <laughs> if um, that we kind of complain to each other most of the time. Like if that is exactly the right way. If power goes, you should call ESCOM. Um, if there's a problem on your road, you should call the department. But usually, we really just, you know, using informal language, bitch and moan to each other about services. Like we are unhappy with the situation. But it's not necessary that we communicate that in any effective channel to government. Like it stays within our community. And we grumble and grumble and we grumble, but we're not really telling government what's happening. And then my follow-up question is then, if you complain, what, 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 have you do, what do you do, to fo do when, you, when you follow it up? If you see a pothole in the road and you complain, maybe you're in the car, like this road is really bad, like, do you follow it up? Like, do you make sure that the person in charge knows about it and that they fix it? Like, if you're electricity, like, do you make sure that whatever you complain about is addressed? Like, has anybody, you know, has anybody ever 
kept on calling the department to fix the road or to fix the tap. So in that sense, then, I think these are the three issues that we as citizens have about monitoring services, that we um, complain about them, but that we don't complain to the right people and that we don't follow, follow up our concerns. And so if we don't do that, well then really what we do is we speak in a different language to government. Because if we don't communicate our concerns to government through channels that government understands, and government doesn't understand us being on a road gossiping to each other, government understands only official channels like a filled out document, an application, a phone call, a phone call with a reference number that you follow up. So if we don't do that, well then we essentially talk different languages. And I'm going to show in the next couple of slides why I think it's really dangerous if we talk different languages from government and what that leads to in terms of service delivery if we talk different languages. So the first example of a different language is really this. Has anybody ever seen, anybody ever participated in a service de delivery protest? No. Yes? <laughs> okay. So, well then tell me, why do you think it's a good idea to burn government staff and threaten government people? You scare them. You scare them. If, you, if this lecture goes really bad me, badly and you intimidate me and you scare me, do you think I want to come back and give another one? Do you think if you go to government and you burn their cars and you tell them, you guys are useless, like, get out of here, do you think it's going to make them more likely to actually address your problem? Yes? Who says yes? <laughs> Um, well, we can't have a discussion after this, but I have a feeling, and I'm more than happy to just be proven wrong here, I have a feeling that if we do exactly that, we're kind of chasing government away. Like, these people, they're, they're not going to want to listen to us. They're just going to think, oh, these, they're, they're stupid, that's that, you know? Like, they don't understand, we're trying our best here, and now one thing hasn't worked, and immediately they burn down the whole office. So, it's dangerous, you know? It's a very jumping the gun kind of thinking, like you're skipping all the steps of complaining and you're going straight to kind of revolution, kind of violence, not physical violence against people, but against like uh, things which belong to these people. So I'm not sure. To me, I have classified it as a false language. I don't think that is how we can complain about service delivery. The second example would really be no information. So if I'm as a citizen, if I'm not informed about the services that I'm entitled to, if I don't know that I have, let me actually ask, do you know the difference? So our constitution says that we have f should have free water and free housing. Do you know what the difference is between these two wordings of the policies? What does it mean if government says you, you should have free housing if we're building RDP houses? Have you ever got into detail? So what they really say is that they have to give you free access to housing. That's how the legislation is written. So they don't have to literally build you a house wherever you want it. They have to make sure that you have access to a house. And that may very well be that they give you cheaper loans, that they uh, contract someone else to build the house, and that you have to move. So this is what free housing means. Free water, on the other side, means that government literally has to provide you water. So if your water is not working, they have to come with water trucks and deliver the water. So if we think about services, then we as citizens, we really need to be informed about what is it that we are entitled to and what is it that government has promised. So we need to know, basically, well, what is my right? And if we don't have this information, then I think it's really difficult to monitor this information. Um, so on that, I would also just quickly want to know, who of you has ever read the National Development Plan? Anybody? Why, why, why haven't you, why do you think government writes a, it's I think almost 400 pages plus document lying out in detail, step by step, how they want to improve South Africa, how they want to improve South Africa for us, for the citizens. And I mean, this is, I think, a common situation, like in the lectures that we give at APK, people also haven't read the NDP. Well, if I'm a citizen of this country, I want to improve this country, why haven't I ever looked at the document that lays out in detail how government wants to improve this country so that I can actually decide if I agree or disagree with it? 
I, I love the NDP, to be honest. Uh, and I really think if you have time, it makes lots of sense to at least read the executive document. But it links to it that we don't have information. So if we haven't read the NDP, we don't even know what government wants to do in the next 50 years to improve our lives. So it's going to be difficult for us in 10 years to complain about government. You haven't A, B, and C. Because when they told us what they're going to do, we never read it. We never accessed information. OK, so lastly then, the last example of false language is no language. And that really means, well, if we just talk to each other about our problems, about the problems in our communities, the absence of services, well, government is not going to know, ever. So you have to use government channels to tell government about what is wrong in your communities so that government really does know about it. Because change really only happens if enough people speak up in the same voice. And I think through this picture you could add in the same, in, in, a, in a correct and adequate manner. So is there any questions on um, the issue of false language within um, citizen-based monitoring? Anybody else want to add anything at this point? Okay. So how many of you think government wants to listen to us. Do you think government is interested in your opinion? Hmm? Personally? Yes? No? Maybe? Okay. <laughs> what about you? Do you think government is interested in your opinion? Okay. What makes you say that? What about you? Do you think government is interested in your opinion? Hmm? Don't think so? Why not? Never nobody ever asks you or they don't seem to be concerned? Okay. But do we do we agree though in general that because we've elected government that they should be responsible to us, isn't it? Yeah. So if we say government doesn't want to listen, they don't care about our opinion. And um, I do think that there's lots of value in what you've said, that actually there's definitely people in government who want to listen. But usually I find that the perception within South African communities, especially like in uh, disadvantaged communities, is that they feel like government doesn't want to listen to them, that government doesn't want to hear their concerns, that government doesn't really want to address their problems. Well, there's, I think, some good news. So if we go back to our constitution, and without going to which section exactly it is, you can read it up yourself. Well, if you look at point E, so this is official government policy based on the constitution, obviously. So people's needs must be responded to, and the public must be encouraged to participate in policy making. Also, the public administration, which basically is government, must be accountable. Lastly, transparency must be fostered by providing the public with timely, accessible, and accurate information. So if this is what's written in the Constitution, well, then I think we can fair, it's fair enough to say that um, government has to listen. Like they don't have a choice. We have elected them. The Constitution says it very clearly that whatever is done in service delivery, they need to listen to us. They need to listen to know how we feel about it, what we think about it. We have the right to know exactly how they're going to spend our tax money. They have to be accountable. It's not for us to literally, like, you know, be always on their trails. Like, they have to have the documentation in place when they put out tenders, when they spend money. So, government has to have the information. And they have to be transparent about it. So, really, if we complain to each other in our community saying, but government doesn't listen to us, the first thing to take away is, well, government has to listen. They don't have a choice. Like, they have to listen to our voices. And I think there's even more good news, apart from the fact that government really has to listen by design. Well, if I give you a couple of quotes, and apologies for the text-heavy slides in this department. Um, Citizens cannot be passive recipients if government is to deliver services that addresses real needs. 
Also, as a democratic nation, the voice of citizens is integral to building a capable developmental state in South Africa. Government monitoring systems need to include the views and experience of citizens. And lastly, citizen-based monitoring must form an integral part of service delivery improvement plans and management decision-making processes. So, in a way, this is too good to be true, and I hope you believe me if I tell you that this is all direct quotes from here. This is all direct quotes taken from the citizen-based monitoring framework. So this is what government says. This is not what Lawrence says, this is not what UJ says. This is what government has to say about service delivery. So government says, please, citizens cannot be passive. Government says, if we want to develop this country, if we want to make it a developmental state without the voice and input of the citizens, this is never going to work. Government says, if we monitor our services, we need to include the citizens in it. So, if I sum that up, well, I think to me, it looks like government wants to listen. So it's not just that they have to listen by constitutional design. Their very own policies, their very own agenda, actually shows that they want to listen to us. Like they have developed a 50-pager on how they would hope to include our voices into the delivery of services and the monitoring of it. So then I think if what that boils down to is that actually all of us are monitors. Like all of us, government gives us the role, gives us back the power that we've given them by electing them to hold them accountable, to monitor their services, to ensure that services are delivered on point, in time, and in an effective manner. Does that make sense? Would you agree that uh, we, have a mo we as citizens have a role to play in monitoring services? Yes? Okay, that's good. Then I think we're on the right track. So, coming then to the more academic bits. So if we have established that we need to talk an effective language with government in terms of monitoring services, if we've established that government wants to listen to us and they have to listen to us, now, the next 10 minutes or so is going to be about how do we actually do that? How do we actually achieve a situation in which government is listening to us? And it's going to be very closely linked to the citizen-based monitoring framework, which I hope you're going to have online on EduLink. Um, yeah, so let's get into that bit. So any last questions before I jump into the more technical details? Like is a is the bigger picture clear of why services needs to be monitored? Yeah? Okay. So, if government wants to listen, if government has to listen, but still we complain about services, maybe it's like no one is talking to government. <laughs> maybe government is that like poor little lost dog, like there, you know, no one, no one is talking to them. They're out there, they've put this document up and can I ask, Anybody has heard about the citizen-based monitoring framework before? No, no? Well, see why I said government is a bit of like a lonely guy, you know, that child on the playground that no one wants to play with? Like they, <laughs> they, like they put out this document, they write like 40 pages on exactly how they would want us to help them monitor services. Well, what do we do? We don't even read the document. We don't even know about it. So. Maybe then it's really like that government, um, that no one is talking to government. And, well, as I said, all the quotes that I've shown you on the previous slides, you know, about how we cannot be passive citizens, how we need to be active in a developmental state. Well, it really boils down to that if government wants to talk to us, but we don't want to talk to them, well, we really become, we become passive in a sense. And I think that that's dangerous. So if I think about services and government, I think of myself as a client of government. Because government is providing, it's like a company, you know. I pay them with my taxes, they're supposed to fix the roads. So if they don't fix the road, it's like a bad company. But a bad company, if the customer doesn't tell the company that, well, you've done a useless job, you know, you haven't fixed my plumbing at all, the company's not gonna change, is it? You know? If I can get away with fixing something cheaply that breaks and I only spend half an hour on it, but I get billed for two hours, well, for me as a company, that's great, you know? I can have one and a half hours to myself. So, 
I think I would hope that you can take away if one of the things from the lecture that try to perceive yourself as a client of government and claim that right. Claim that right that services are for you, services are financed by you, and therefore it's your task and your right to really make sure that government does what they promise to do. And yeah, don't be a passive citizen. Be like a monitor. Be a monitor to government. So then I think in a bit more technical detail, well, what is citizen-based monitoring? Um, well, on the most basic level, it's really the systematic use of citizens' voices in the monitoring of government services. And citizen-based monitoring hasn't, you know, it's nothing necessarily too new. Um, it emerged in the 1990s with the WIDA talking about the new public management framework. I'm not sure if someone is poli studying politics here, you might have heard about it. Um, but yeah, so it's a wider drive. I think it's fair enough to say in, in most continents that citizens should be on the center of monitoring. And with the spread of information, with the spread of mobile technologies, we kind of also now have the tools to do that very easily and conveniently. Like just the other day I was flying with SAA and they had a really beautiful meal, like the best meal I've, I've ever got on a plane. So they have a Twitter account that gives them feedback. So I told them, well, thank you very much. That was brilliant. On the other side, I'm not sure who's with MTN. If you ever tried, if you have a problem with MTN, you can tweet them. They're very, they're much better responding to tweets than responding to actually calling them. The same with FNB. So if you can see, it comes from the private sector that we want client engagement in the delivery of our services. And it now it is increasingly applied in the state sector. So it's in that sense then, um, if I talk about the systematic use of citizen voices in the monitoring, it's really the emphasis is on that systematic, not on that sporadic. If I myself, you know, I'm a bit of a you know, weird person and I keep on calling government and I complain about everything, everything, everything. As one individual, they're not going to take me seriously. If there's a problem and only one person re reports it, they're not going to think this problem is really important. So it has to be systematic. It has to be lots of us and it has to be in a channel that fits into what government wants. So a, a good example of how citizen-based monitoring went wrong because it wasn't systematic. Uh, anybody heard of the presidential hotline that Zuma has established? Yes? How many have heard about it? Just show me with a show of hands. Okay. Anybody ever called it? Okay, well then, you guys are the clever ones. So this hotline, after they put it in, it got like close to 10,000 calls every day. So people were using that hotline for reporting everything, from their cat on the tree to the broken tab, <laughs> uh, and it completely, like, the, the people couldn't. Like, you can't deal with so many calls. And the hotline was really designed as a last minute tool, like if something really bad has happened. It was designed for the big, big problems. But because people didn't know about all the other ways that I'm going to talk about just now, how they could monitor, well, they all jumped the gun and they all called and, well, it has become absolutely ineffective because government cannot deal with so many calls at once. I mean, how is Zuma supposed to respond <laughs> to my cat on the tree right now? <laughs> and yeah, so it has to be systematic in that sense if we talk about uh, citizen-based monitoring. Um, and the aim is really to make government more accountable and to make government more effective. And I think if we break down accountable a little bit, it really means that the information should, like we need to get the, the control about service delivery. We need to get it out of the hands from people who sit in Pretoria, um, who, people who sit in Cape Town, and get, them, get it into the hands of people who sit on the ground, your local councillors, your community forums, us basically. So if we talk about accountability, it really, we talk about the lower level of government who are actually involved in the practical service delivery, not the big guns who design service delivery. And effective, as I said, as I defined earlier on, um, well, we need services that fulfill their purpose. We need good roads, we need water, we need electricity. So if that's not happening, we need to monitor, we need to tell them about it, and that's then how services can become more effective, basically. Um, so, maybe just, do you think we have that at the moment in South Africa? Do we have effective service delivery? Hmm? Yeah, I agree. Which areas would you think we have effective delivery?
been compared to when I visit my cousin to stay in bed for they go now and it's just like 30 minutes ago. In an hour it's back. Well this side you can even do it even the next day and it's not even yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I stay in Brixton and yeah, we have the same problem. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's a really good point. So it really varies. I mean, if I drove to Soweto this morning, I was kind of stuck in traffic because there were so many rear wire buses, which I'm happy to be stuck in traffic if it's for a rear wire bus because government is doing their job and that means if I'm five minutes late, it's fine, you know. Um, on the other side, when I was now in the Eastern Cape, yeah, there were no buses. There are no roads, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so clearly it really varies. So South Africa, it's really interesting because we have cases where it does work. So we have the ability to design effective services in Soweto, in Santan, in town, but then we have our areas close by Deep Kloof Orange Farm where we don't have these services. So it's really about trying to figure out why do we have some areas where it works and why do we have some areas where it doesn't work. And I think it has lots to do with how government perceives how we monitor them. Because they know in Soweto, people are going to tell them nonsense. The moment they don't deliver services, no, Soweto is like a showcase. Soweto is famous. So they're going to make sure this looks good. On the other side, Deep Kloof Orange Farm ish. <laughs> they don't really care about that eh? at some point. So, therefore, your service delivery really varies where you are and varies how much engagement does the community have with government. Okay, so to sum that up, what is citizen-based monitoring? Well, it can only work if we have active citizens who are informed about and willing to monitor service delivery. And that really means, as I said, we need to know what services we are entitled to. I need to know that if I don't have water, government better bring me water. But I also need to know government doesn't have to bring me a house. They just have to give me access that I can acquire a house myself. So we need to know about what we're entitled to, and we need to be willing to monitor it. So if I think it's too much work for me to tell government constantly if there's a pothole, if I don't want to tweet about potholes, if I don't want to you know, spend five minutes of my day calling in a hotline saying, look, no water, no teacher. Well, if I don't want to do that, well, citizen-based monitoring is not going to work. So it requires us to want to know what we're entitled to, and it requires us to actually be willing to monitor the service delivery. So, well, why? Why would we want to do this citizen-based monitoring? And I think I've touched on this already. Um, because we as a beneficiary, we as a clients of government. No? It's for us, service delivery is our baby. We're supposed to benefit. That's why we have to be the people monitoring it. Because government is not going to do it by themselves. 